three, two, one. Three, two, one. Good morning, everybody. Such a blessing to be here this morning. We are a few minutes late. Yeah, but you have to excuse us on that. But um, just want to thank the Lord for everything He's doing, everything He's done. Amen. He said, give thanks in everything. Amen. And so we're supposed to give thanks in everything. And you know, I was just thinking, listening all. I, I'm kind of glad. I was talking to somebody else. I'm kind of glad that all this is about over. You know, get get it on and keep on going with the president, all this stuff, because it's all, if you look at it, it's all about self anyway. It is. They just, everybody's trying to glorify themselves, and it's all about them. But, uh, but it's supposed to be about the Lord and everything he's done for us, and that might just be a calling where he's telling us, hey, it's time to turn and look at me, you know. Get quick depending on man and looking at all this other thing because it's so corrupt. Everything is, is so corrupt. It's uh, it's not it's not funny at all. It's a shame, and our kids gonna have to grow up with it. But you know, the people made a decision and they chose to uh, side with who they chose. Everybody has a right, and they did it. So thank the Lord for it. Heard somebody come in. Um, so we're gonna open up with a word of prayer. If I can get Brother Dave to open us up this morning. Amen. The Lord, we're gonna say, the Lord again. We do thank you for this day, Lord God. We do thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love that you show us continually and ongoingly, Lord. No matter what happens, Lord God, like Brother Tommy just said, you're in control, Lord, and your people need to be looking at you and not looking Amen. around, Lord God. And Father, we need to look towards each other. Lord, the outside world is the outside world, yes, Lord, Lord and, and we let things that uh, shouldn't matter matter to us and and uh, make a big deal out of it, and it's, it is not pleasing in, in your eyes, Lord God. Just We need to keep focused on you continually and ongoingly, no matter what happens and no matter what, what's here or what's there, Lord, because there's nothing we can do about it, but you can do all things, Lord, and Father, we put our trust in you. Everything will be accomplished in our lives. Our lives will run smoothly. We'll have peace. Father, all the way to the end, whether you take us out in the, the uh, taking away of the church or whether it be by the grave, Lord. Father, we uh, we do pray for the ones that are coming, Lord, that uh, that uh, you'll, you'll bless them and help them and get them here safe and whole, Lord God. And Father, that, uh, that they'll be ready to receive the word no matter when they get here, Lord. And Father, we do uh, pray for all of the sick ones here, the ones that have uh, sicknesses and afflictions here in our church and on the outside that we pray for all the time, Lord God, that we pray that, Father, you put your healing hand on us, that, that you'll help us, that you'll lift us up, Lord, that, that uh, you'll be in it and you'll give us uh, much comfort and their families, Lord. And we do pray for uh, Sister Teresa here and her loss, Lord God, that yeah. Father, that uh, you'll give much comfort to her and her family, Lord, and Father, that uh, you'll help her and bring her through these times. It's a, it's a kind of a, um, a, a large, um, I don't know whether I'm calling it a hassle or not, but to get uh, somebody prepared and uh, and uh, get them planted, Lord, is a, a lot to it and a lot of work, and and uh, Lord, and it, it is vexing on us, Lord, and. Father, if you'll give us that comfort and, and to help us through these things, Lord, and they'll, they'll go over a lot easier, Lord. And Father, uh, just about everybody in here has been through it one time or another with something or another, with one loved one or another, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you give her much comfort and, and give her easement of heart, Lord. And Father, uh, we do pray for the services, the Sunday school services, Lord, and the, uh, the preaching hour, Lord. And, that uh, you'll be in it, Lord, that you'll give us what you'd have us to have, Lord God, that, Father, that everybody here has been prayed up, and, and Father, that uh, they've uh, they've asked you to forgive their sins, Lord God, that uh, you'll have full reign of the services, Lord, that they've prayed, Lord, that uh, you've got what you'd have them to have, and to help and strengthen them accordingly, and I know I did already, Lord, and, Amen. Father, I pray that, uh, that uh, you'll be in the service and, and be with the with the with the preaching and the in the scripture reading, Lord, Father, and uh, we do pray, Lord, we're going to have fellowship after church to, uh, this afternoon, Lord God, that uh, 
you'll be in that, that we're going to break bread together, Lord, and Father, that uh, you'll be in that, that uh, everything's done neat and in order, Lord, that uh, you'll bless the ones that uh, prepared and, and bought and labored, Lord God, to, to provide your people with a meal this afternoon, and we'll give you all the praise, honor, and the glory. We thank you and praise you, Lord. Jesus Christ, thank you, pray. Amen. 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 Uh, Brother McVeigh will be with us on the 29th. 29th, Brother McVeigh will be here. on the 29th, too. Okay, good. That's a blessing. Thank the Lord. Miss Randall won't be here. She said she should be back by Wednesday. And Phil's at a wedding. Good, good, good morning. Good morning. All right. This morning, if you have your song books, which we have plenty of them, let's open this. We need God's grace more than anything. Go to Amazing Grace. 236. Thirty-six. <clears throat> Y'all prepared for this voice out there? <clears throat> you got it. <laughs> Are you gonna get it? <clears throat> you want it or not? Oh, well, yeah, exactly. It's on, so they're getting it. <laughs> All right. All right, Jasmine. Everyone's prepared. Amen. Play loud. Yep. Yeah, play it real loud. For the people out there, too. <laughs> Jimmy Jones. <laughs> Flipping it there, sir, because I got to flip down over here. Y'all, excuse me for a moment. Where is everybody? Nobody's <laughs> Miss Randall's out of town. Uh, Phil's going to a wedding in Myrtle Beach. I haven't heard from Angel and Brittany. Petra's on her way with the solid bra. Uh, Tim is helping get his cousins or something ready for church. So I don't know. Or, I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, the lily of the valley, in him I own I see, all I need to make and make me fully whole, in sorrow he's my comfort, in sorrow he's my stay, he tells me every care of him to roll, 
the morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I'm all for him forsaken, and all my sorrows torn from my heart. And now he teases me by his bow. Though all the world forsake me, and say and tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, or yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, all I find about me, I have nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping out to glory, I see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. Hallelujah, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. All right. Well, we changed things around a little bit this morning. So time to be ready here in a minute. All you Trumpers out there and in here, don't worry, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Amen. And even if it is, God's still on the throne. He's still in control. And he promised to take care of his people. Amen. Amen. It just makes me so sad to see a bunch of devils dancing around Washington. Heathens. Heathens. That's right. Heathens. Yes, sir. The lion tongue is but for a moment. So yeah. Compared to eternity, that's what it is. Drop in the bucket. Yeah. A grain of sand on the seashore. Amen. All right, Brother Tommy, you ready? Um, I will be. All right. Maybe not. They really confused him. Got me all all messed up this morning. We all kinds of directions. Let's see here. And what direction we're gonna go? We going in our Bible this morning. Like I said, I want to thank the Lord for allowing us to be able to be here today to come worship the Spirit and Truth. And and just pray, pray for our country. And you know, like I said, God's in control of it all. He appoints who he wanted there, and that's who was appointed. And it's all it's all said and done, quit. No sense of being frustrated, arguing, fighting over this, because that's what the devil wants. He wants us to argue and fuss and fight and get our eyes off the Lord, and that's what's happened to America. We got our eyes off of God. That's just a faint prank, just a fact. There's no Amen. ifs, ands, and buts about it, because it's all about self. Amen. We only care about ourselves, don't care about anything else, that God has done for us and prepared for us for the people that believe and receive. And so that's what broke me. I, I mean, got me over in First Kings this morning. In chapter 18, I was uh, studying and asking the Lord. I was in the deer stand, yes, well, the tree climber. I climbed up in a tree, and of course I didn't really see anything but a bunch of uh, squirrels. But the Lord put me there for a reason, because I did carry my phone up and I had read, and I was reading, I was praying, and uh, and it was just so peaceful, peaceful being out there mm. by myself with no, with nothing else going on. I understand why Brother Dave really enjoys being in woods. It's, it's a joy to be out there with no other stuff coming in on top of you. It's you and the Lord, and if it's your rifle in your hand, <laughs> it's your rifle. <laughs> But, uh, and, you know, so I was, I'm thankful for that. The Lord, we still got freedom to be able to go, go out and do Amen. things. We don't have to be locked up in our homes. You know, God gives us that to have joy. He expects us to have, you know, go out and do things, ple- things that are pleasurable to us. He gives us that. He's still giving us that. We still have rights to do things. So it ain't no sense of frowning and, and crying about all this. Just enjoy what he has given us and the time that we have to be able to spend with him. And if it's out in the woods, to have, you know, and, and like I said, if it's out there to have fellowship with him, good. 
<laughs> yeah, it's for everybody, exactly. Now, Dave says I still want to kill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, like I told Brother Dave after he shot that deer yesterday, and he called me over. I was going to go help him, but, you know, when you're a deer slayer as he is and all the years he's going to put into, you know, time and all with cleaning deer, he was already done when I got there. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, again. <laughs> but uh, he said, don't get yourself messed up. I got this. But um, it was just a blessing because I, I told him, I said, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I want to sit there and, and pray, and, and Lord knows I want to go hunting, and, and I enjoy shooting deer and going on the hunt and all, but sometimes I didn't, I had that. We sent Brother Dave and Brother Roger around to supply this church and other people with needs that love deer meat, and I love deer meat. <laughs> I do. Way beyond anything else. You can ask my wife, and it, like I said, I eat it three times a day, but um, it's just a joy to be able to go out and be able to enjoy God's creation, things he gave us to look at, you know. Okay, and so we in 1 Kings chapter 18 this morning, I was like I was just sitting and reading my Bible and thinking about all the things going on. You know, it's nothing new to us. It shouldn't be. Not a Christian. We should know what's going on around us. You know, we know this world's wicked. We know what's in the heart of man. You know, and the devil wants to, what's he want to do with each and every one? He wants to break fellowship with him. And he, I think the devil's done a pretty good job of it. By the looks of things, <coughs> he has. So be careful. What, Chapter 18 is where I'm going to start. It's actually, I was reading all through First Kings yesterday and back and forth. And like I said, a lot of times in my head, it's like a pinball machine. There's so many thoughts. It just gets back and forth, banging all over the place because and I have to stop right then and write it down. If I don't, I won't remember because I come up with another thought. I do. And if you don't write it down, you'll sit there beating yourself all day long for over one little thing. And, you know, God's trying to show us. And I was telling my wife this morning, matter of fact, early this morning, and I said, you know, I read my Bible and a lot of times I have a thought in my head that the Lord's put on me and I, I read over some of the other things and say, hey, I skipped and I'm looking at work. I'm looking for this verse and I already read over it because I have my mind somewhere else, not focused on reading everything God's word. And that's what we do. We don't we don't focus on God's word. We don't apply his word to our life. Every word that's written in his here is for us to look at, to examine. Amen. So we can examine ourselves according to God's word. But man don't want to examine himself. He wants to examine everybody else. What's wrong with Dale? You know, things like that. I can tell you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> What's wrong with these people here? And you'll pick out everything that's wrong with them instead of looking and examining yourselves according to God's word. Because we're a selfish group of people. And then we go, and I was thinking about here with Ahab and Obadiah and uh, Elijah, things how people, how Israel got away from God. They started worshiping other gods, other idols. They put God, they pushed him out of everything. And what happens then? Judgment. Bad stuff comes upon the children of God whenever they push God out. Have you ever thought about that? Look what happened here. And I'm going to read a, a scripture this morning. I am going to read. And it says in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, and, it, and we're going to start here. It says, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto it. Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Samaria, And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of, of the, his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. And Jezebel, let me show you what that is. What is Jezebel? And I looked this up because somebody calls you Jezebel. Here you go. <laughs> and I just thank the Lord just for... Be able to go to his word and to look things up. And it says, 
Jezebel is. Hold on, did I? I'll get right in a minute. Yeah, Jezebel. An impudent, daring, vicious woman. That's what it says. <laughs> Think about it. Exactly. So if somebody calls you a Jezebel, you'll you'll better look out for them people. And uh a vicious woman. Somebody has nothing in their, you know, but hate to uh, in their heart, pretty much. And back in these days, the prophets were hiding. Ahab, um, Obadiah went and hid some of the prophets in the mountains, okay? Because De Jezebel was killing them, destroying them, getting rid of all these prophets. Because they didn't want God to retain God at all in their knowledge. They didn't want God. She didn't. And she didn't want anybody else to have any knowledge of God. Get God out. We're going to worship our own God. And so the Lord sends Elijah to go. And it says, and, and verse 4 again of 18, it says, For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks preadventure. We may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou the man, my Lord? Art that, are thou that my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell the, thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, what have, I, what have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant unto the hand of Ahab to slay him? And the Lord thy God liveth there in no nation or kingdom, whether my Lord has not sent to seek thee. And when they said, he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou say, sayest, go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Man, this man's scared. He don't want to go. He's afraid he's going to get killed now. But he goes, tell him Elijah's here. And they're looking for Elijah to kill him, get rid of him. And it says, and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee, whether I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my, my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets? by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Well, he's just saying, hey, I did all these things, Lord. Don't I, I don't want to be killed now. I did these, so you know, to, to save these prophets of yours. And he says, and now thou sayest, go to tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah, went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. See, they, they started following their own gods. They push God out, and that's what they're trying to do. And you look at today, and I'm going to go ahead and put it as today. That's what we've done now. It's no different. We've pushed God out. And I wrote down, we're a bunch of broken down people. And that's what we are. We're broken down. We are. And it says, now, therefore, there's Tim coming in the door now. Good morning, Tim. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal and 450. And the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long <coughs> halt ye between two options? Opinions. Okay. Opinion, yeah, thank you. Opinions. 
if the Lord be God, follow him. He's telling them, if the Lord's God, follow him. But it says, but if Baal, then follow him. He said, you got a choice. Follow who you want to. But I'm going to show you who God is. God's going to show himself to us. And it says, oh, and, and the people answered him not a word. They couldn't. They were, they were stuck. They couldn't answer anything because they'd been following Baal. They knew who God was, but they made a choice. And it says, let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut in, it into pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. Well, here we go. God and your God. I'm going to show you who God is. He said, that's what Elijah saying. Here you go. Go, go get your God. Let's see how great he is. Let's see what he can deliver you from. And it says, and I call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose ye one bullet for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many and call on the name of your gods. But put no fire under. And they took the bullet which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal. I'm in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, verse 26. And, and call on the name of Baal from morning until until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is, he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or preadventure he sleepeth and must be awake. And he's telling them, Hey, call on your God. Hurry up. Get him up. Is he asleep? Where's he at? Where's your God at that you're worshiping? The one that's going to deliver you from all these things. And he says, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that their was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded there wasn't anybody anything there the only people that heard was them they was crying to themselves because their god couldn't answer them and it says and elijah uh oh and elijah said to all the people come near unto me and all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the lord that was broken down and that's what God wants us to do. He wants his people to go and prepare themselves. We have to fix ourselves, get ourselves ready, prepared to go meet the Lord. We want to have fellowship with God. We got to go to that altar, Pastor. We got to get ourselves clean up, get that junk out of our lives so God can heal our land. Second uh, Chronicles. <clears throat> 714. Look at here. See, because this is Elijah's telling these people, hey, your altars have been broken down. You ain't got yourself right. You're worshiping other gods. They can't do anything for you. Second Chronicles 714. And so many times people, they go to this verse and they say, oh, here you go, Lord. And they start praying. And they said, and it says, verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. But here it is. All these people want to do all these things. They want God to heal their land. They want God to do things for them. But they ain't willing to do anything for him. They don't want to get the sin out of their life. He says, and turn from their wicked ways. That should be underlined in your Bible. That's what you should underline. Highlight that. Turn from your wicked ways. 
then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will hear their land. God wants you to come to him. He wants fellowship with us. We talking about we got everything's broken down. We got a broken down altar. Well, it's time to rebuild that fellowship with the Lord. It's our time to get ourselves ready. We want to see prayer answered. We want to see God change things. But you ain't willing to clean yourselves up. He's a holy God. Amen. He's not going to put up with foolishness, with sin. He's not going to fellowship with sin. He's not going to heal anything. He's going to let you make your choice. Live your life the way you want to live your life. Focus on your gods, whatever they may be. Pastor says all the time, my money, cars, it could be anything which is your God. It takes you away from God, the true and living God. The one that has delivered his people. Amen. And he wants you to have fellowship. The devil wants to do one thing. He wants to keep us fighting. He wants the saints to be fighting amongst themselves. He wants us to be fighting back and forth, Brother Dave, about every little thing in the world. So we can get our focus off of him. And that's what these people did. They got their focus off, off of the Lord. When Elijah was sent to show them. All these things that have been happening to you. All this bad stuff. Your God can't deliver you from anything. All he can do is get you deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. That's a fact. You get away from God, it's all bad. But he says here, he says... And if, it said, and if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble yourself and pray and get that junk out of your life. He wants to do these things for us, but he can't. Because we ain't we afraid to go to that altar. You know why we're scared of the altar? Because we've got too much sin in our life. We don't want to let go of things. But Elijah's telling, hey, let's build this altar. He says, and Elijah said in verse 30 in, second, in first Kings, and Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones. See, hey, there was even a, a order it had to be done in. When God comes in, he cleans us up, First John 1, 9. We go there, we get ourselves cleaned up. That's where we're supposed to start. That's how we're supposed to start our day. Get ourselves cleaned up so God can have that fellowship. So he can answer the prayers of his saints. Of the people that truly love him. The people that are seeking his face. But usually we wake up, run out the door and do what we want to do. Leave God out of it. The best thing I heard yesterday, Brother Dave talked about, he said he gets there, he goes to the deer stand, he prays for it, he goes to the deer stand, he prays when he gets in the deer stand, he prays when he comes out of the deer stand. He does. That was, that was such a blessing to hear that yesterday. It, it encouraged me. It did. Praying God is sending deer. Well, that, that's what, hey, he says that. Because, and, and I, he did. He said that. I prayed the Lord because he said the Lord was in it. He said it. He said he knew for a fact that the Lord was in it. He said, I prayed. And there it was. Looked over his shoulder and there was a deer sitting right there. When God's in things, things change. God wants to have fellowship. He wants to see change in our lives. Amen. He wants us to enjoy him, the things he has done, the things he has given us. Yeah. Amen. He wants us to enjoy these things, but he wants us to put him first. He wants us to repair that altar, to get that, get ourselves right, be able to go before him. Things that we get, cry, get them out of your life so we can have fellowship. And everybody's worried about Oh, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? It doesn't matter. God's Amen. in control of it. Amen. We're putting our focus everywhere but where we need to have it. Amen. And it's a shame because we're the Christians. Amen. We need to be focused on the Lord. What he has for us. What he has done for us. What he is wanting to give us. Well, I'm going to end here so Dale can come up this morning.
and do the trail of blood. But y'all, I just want everybody to look at itself, examine themselves according to God's word and see where you're at. If your altar has been broken down, it's time to get it in order. It's time to fix it. Because God wants that fellowship. He wants to fix things. and But he wants us to see. We try to go in the wilderness. There's no reason for it. He didn't want to go us to go through bad things. He wants us to focus on him. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tommy. That more words of inspiration to get us started and get us warmed up here this morning. My name is Dale Simpson, and it is both an honor and a pleasure to be here before you this morning on www.concordindependentbaptistchurch.com and on Facebook at Frank Townsend, S E N D. Uh, also on the web, that's Facebook. And uh, we're going to pick up here this morning in the book that we have been covering for the past couple of months now, The Trail of Blood by J.M. Carroll. And we're on page 33. This is what the book looks like. And if you would like a copy, I understand we will try to oblige and get you one if you contact uh, Preach. He'll be happy to give you one or get you one mail to you or put it in the uh, postal service and may you may get it or you may not uh, but uh, we'll give it a try we're on page 33 and first a quick word of prayer before we get started here most gracious heavenly father thank you again for another fabulous sunday morning we give thanks for allowing us all to come together here safely this morning and worship in thy name and lord we we ask that if there is anything that I may have trespassed here since the last time I prayed that you, uh, or anything that is not pleasing in your sight, I ask for forgiveness, Lord. And Lord, we also ask for you to guide us and keep us on that path of righteousness and, and continue to enhance each and every one of us as knowledge and ability to witness for you, Lord. This is the reason we all come together and worship. Uh, Lord, I ask that you give me the verbal clarity to convey a message this morning, which is both spiritually inciting and also knowledgeable. All these things I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going, uh, we're on page 33. We're going to start there at number 11. And I will say that this was so intriguing to me this week as I worked on this for <laughs> For several hours and I kept getting off on other tangents which is really easy to do from someone that that loves history uh, it says here number 11 in 1560 19 years after Calvin's first uh, organization in Geneva Switzerland John Knox a disciple of Calvin established the first Presbyterian Church in Scotland and just 32 years later in 1592, the Presbyterian became the State Church of Scotland. So I did a little research to look into John Knox, and I found him to be very interesting and uh, one of the one of our forefathers that helped bring us to the religious freedom that we practice here in the United States today, and and it all. St- started with with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it evolved and these guys were highly persecuted and just carried heavy burdens all down through history. And we'll start here on Knox that said he was a he's also known before I get started as the preacher with a sword. And he actually stood up I tell you what, let's go to uh, before I get started here. He obviously believed this part of uh, Nehemiah 4.14. If you turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah 4.14. Yeah, the, Knox was one that was a pastor that carried a sword, and nowadays pastors need to carry guns, <laughs> which is, I guess, passing the torch of, of religious freedom. And uh, if you get on Nehemiah there, 414, it says, 
And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And now we'll just get into a little bit about John Knox. Uh, it said he was a minister of the Christian gospel who advocated violent revolution. He was considered one of the most powerful preachers of his day. But only two of his hundreds of sermons he preached were ever published. He was a key figure in the formation of modern Scotland. Yet there is only one monument erected to him in Scotland. His grave is beneath a parking lot. And I believe this stems from the fact that most of these guys did not want to be reviled and have people come there to worship and practice what we know as ideology, which is what he fought vehemently against, which was one of the traits that the Catholic Church still has problems with today. Uh, John Knox was indeed a man of many paradoxes, a Hebrew Jeremiah set down in Scotland's soil. In a relentless campaign of fiery oratory, he sought to destroy what he felt was ideology and purify Scotland's religion, uh, taking up the cause. John Knox was born around 1514 at Haddington, a small town in south, south of Edinburgh. Around 1529, he entered the University of Andrews and went on to study theology. He was ordained in 1536, but became a notary, then a tutor of sons of local lairds. And lairds were the nobility uh, in Scotland, and they were actually the lower level. They weren't the actual guys that were in charge, but you still had to be fairly uh, wealthy to, to be able to hire a tutor anyway. Dramatic events were unfolding in Scotland during Knox's youth. Which brings me back to another of the people that's not mentioned in our book here. But there was, I'm sure that Knox was influenced by this guy. His name was Patrick Hamilton. You heard of him preach? Dave? James? Uh, anybody? Patrick Hamilton, who was the, predece uh, was the predecessor of uh, Knox, he was born in 1504, and he died in 1528. Uh, he was actually of, of uh, I guess say not uh, no, not the son of a noble or a ruler, but he was. The family was pretty well off, and he got an education. He went to uh, St. Andrews where he was pretty much earmarked to become a Catholic priest or bishop. And that didn't work out, and he was not happy. But also at this time, we have the teachings of Martin Luther getting into Scotland. And some of them fell into his hands, and he began to study and read and could see the corruption within the Catholic Church. And the fallacy of the teachings of many of the Catholics priests there in Scotland. And he began to preach against it, uh, basically off of the foundations of what we call Lutherans now. And it drew the ire of the Catholic Church, and they uh, reacted very vehemently against him. He eventually was, was cornered and captured. I think he actually would was invited to come in to appear or summoned by a Catholic bishop or uh, he may have been a priest that was named Beaton, B-E-A-T-O-N. And this guy uh, exacted a little bit of revenge on him and uh, basically put, put uh, Patrick Hamilton on trial found him guilty of heresy and and very rapidly burned him at the stake. Uh, this was 
an awful thing if, if for what we've talked about so far being burned alive is is a very horrible torturous thing and it's hard for us to conceive that as christians today but it was practiced pretty often back in those days when he burned this guy he put him in the turn in the town square and people that witnessed this uh had some very very strong reactions to it and it did not do anything but strengthen the resolve of the, his followers in fact when Beaton consulted with the catholic hierarchy after that they told him if he did it again that he needed to, to do it in a basement or a cellar that the fumes and if you can imagine anybody that smelt i brought this up before burning flesh it is very obnoxious and it will fill your nasal cavities and and they told he he was told by the catholic hierarchy that it was infectious and that he may be doing more harm than good and he must have went to the the egyptian pharaoh's school of knuckleheads and not listened because he was obviously very hard-headed and it it had a little effect on him uh this would come back to haunting. Uh, let me continue on here. Uh, da, 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 da. In the early 1540s, Knox came under the influence of converted reformers. And under the preachings of Thomas, I think this is Gilliman, uh, Gilliman, uh, he joined them. Knox became a bodyguard for the fiery Protestant preacher George Wishart. W-I-S-H-A-R-T, who was spreading the gospel throughout Scotland. Uh, in 1556, however, beaten again, this was 18 years after the first, ah, he may have burned some other people at the stake, he seemed to enjoy it, but uh, beaten had wise, Wisheart arrested, tried, strangled and burned in response <laughs> i like this part this goes back to nehemiah 4 14. in response a party of 16 protestant nobles stormed the castle assassinated been been beaten beaten whatever his name was and mutilated his body the castle was immediately put under siege by a fleet of french ships uh, Catholic France was an ally to Scotland, and technically Catholicism was still the, the religion of Scotland. Uh, the castle was, let's say, the, the, uh, though Knox was not privy to the murder, he did approve of it. And during a break in the siege, he joined the besieged party in the castle, meaning he was on the outside. And whenever he got his opportunity to get in, he joined the defenders of the castle inside. Uh, during a Protestant service on, well, let me back up here. There's something missing. I'm missing a page. Eventually, the, the Catholics won here and the castle was taken. And Knox, what, uh, many of the, the defenders inside the castle were put in prison. <laughs> Knox was actually assigned to a galley, meaning he was on a boat where they had oars. Now, this is early in the 16th century, and I thought they had gotten past that, but apparently not. And I guess if the wind wasn't blowing, they would shove an oar out the side of the boat and tell them to go for it. <laughs> and uh, which is kind of reminiscent of you know, everybody's seen the. Uh, uh, the Charlton Heston, Heston movie, uh, Ben-Hur, ben there you go, and where he was on a galley that where he was rowing. Uh, I would imagine, once again, being a prisoner, he would have been chained to it. So if the ship went down, he was going down with it. He was actually on that galley for 19 months and finally was released in which he returned to Scott, uh, I'm sorry, returned to Geneva where he had studied earlier. Uh, it says here, 
uh, during a Protestant service on on a sun one Sunday, a preacher named John Rose spoke on the election of ministers and publicly asked Knox to undertake the office of preacher. When the con congregation confirmed the call, Knox was shaken and reduced to tears. So we did have a soft side. He uh, de declined at first, but eventually submitted and to what was left, what he called a divine call. It was a short-lived ministry in 1547 after St. Andrew's Castle had been again put under siege. Uh, some of the occupants were once again imprisoned. Uh, he made his way to Geneva. The French reformer described Knox as a brother and that, uh, that would have been Calvin. Uh, laboring energetically for the faith. Uh, Knox, for his part, was so impressed with Calvin's Geneva that he actually, uh, let's see, where does he, he called it the something, the, the most perfect school of Christ that was ever on earth since the days of the apostles. And okay, we're just keeping it in proper context. What I'm reading from here is is from the Legionnaire's description of, of John Knox, and the Legionnaire's is a Presbyterian publication, so they they hold Calvin in very high esteem, and to some degree I do too. Knox traveled on to Frankfurt, where he joined other Protestants and quickly became embroiled in controversy. Uh, the Protestants could not agree on the order of worship. Arguments ensued, and they finally, Knox uh, decided that uh, that wasn't the place for him. He went back to Scotland. Uh, Protestants were building their efforts, and congregations were forming all over the country. A group that called itself the Lords of the Congregation vowed to make Protestantism the religion of the land, and in 1555, they invited Knox to... Uh, basically uh, assumed the title as the leader. Uh, Knox spent nine months preaching extensively and persuasively in Scotland before he was forced to return back to Geneva. Uh, he was, and, and a lot of political things were going on at this time too. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots moved into, uh, she was a Catholic. Uh, she moved back in and he had to get hit the bricks and uh, go back to uh, to Geneva to basically keep from uh, getting cooked at the stake. And I said, uh, there, were, there was an increasing uh, amount of Protestant uh, militancy at the time. They would, uh, uh, he became active and vigorous whenever he would, he would start out real quiet and easy going. But by the time he would get to the end of one of his sermons, he would start to uh, equate it to what was going on politically there in Scotland and would become enraged sometimes and start pounding the pulpit and, and get very animated. Uh, in fact, he got so animated that one guy said uh, that uh, he was a note taker. He made me to grow, which is, uh, I had to figure out what that meant. That means to quake and tremble that I could not hold a pen to write. So when he gave a sermon, he gave a sermon. Uh, the lords of the congregation militarily occupied more and more cities so that finally in the 1560s, there was the Treaty of Berwick. The English and the French agreed to leave Scotland. The English were now under Protestant Elizabeth I, had come to the aid of the Protestant Scots and the French had to hit the bricks. The, uh, the future of Protestantism in Scotland was assured at this point and is still pretty, uh, I guess, apparent there today. Uh, I think they have somewhere in the number, they said, uh, what I was reading, 750,000 uh, Presbyterians in Scotland today, 
with another three or four million here in the United States. So they still have a very large congregation. The, uh, the, the parliament ordered Knox and his colleagues to write a couple of books. One was the Confession of Faith, the first book of, of discipline, and another one was the Book of Common Order, uh, all of which were completed. And actually, Knox uh, managed to evade uh, the Catholics and by actually skirting around some of their attempts to catch him and, uh, and believed in carrying the sword. Uh, moving back to the Trail of Blood, if we look at number 12, I said, during all of these hard struggles for reformation, uh, continuous and valuable aid was given to the reformers by many Anabaptists. That would be us. Uh, or whatever other name they bore. Hoping for some relief from their own bitter lot, they came out of their hiding places and fought bravely with the reformers. But they were doomed to fearful disappointment. They were from now on to have two additional persecuting enemies. Both the Lutheran and Presbyterian churches brought out of their Catholic mother many of, their evil, of her evils, among them her idea of a state church. They both soon became established churches. Both were soon in the persecuting business, uh, falling, uh, falling, failing, failing a little falling little, if any, short of their Catholic mother. And we're going to conclude this for today and pick up on page 34 with the trail of blood. Uh, as you can see, the, the persecution continues. Thank you. Amen. And remember, preach God and preach Christ and everything you do. And if you have to use words. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> By the way, who in here is Protestant? <clears throat> Anybody? See, we're neither Protestant nor Catholic. When I went in the service, they put on my dog tags. They asked if you were Protestant or Catholic. I didn't know the difference. They, I said Protestant. But I am a Baptist. Amen. The Protestants were those that came out of Rome, out of the Catholic Church, and protested against Rome. Amen. And therefore, they became Protestants. Amen. Baptists have their origin in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we'll be back in about... 10 minutes for all you listeners. Hey Amen. We've got to check the food and get things ready, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. So please come back and join us. Come on. Shut it up. Oh, yeah. It would be a good idea. Oh, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Sunday school class and the Lord, in the history class, and pray that you'd be with us in the next service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.